All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Hughes. I'm Wayne Dennis, and we haven't met. No, good morning. Good morning. You testified yesterday that you have to give careful attention to gendered stereotypes. That is, that is correct. Uh, when you're talking about in intimate partner violence, you have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes. And during your testimony, you in fact paid attention to gendered stereotypes, correct? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, you said we were going to have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes, and then you testified at length where you referenced both men and women. You paid attention to those stereotypes during the course of your testimony, correct? What I was saying was you have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes when you're conducting these evaluations. You can't assume all the time that the male is the perpetrator and the female is the victim. You have to go into the evaluation understanding that the male also could be the victim of intimate partner violence. In fact, you're aware that there are large-scale studies that do say that IPV towards males does exist. Of course. Okay. And every time... You referred to the characteristic of a victim of intimate partner violence yesterday. You used the pronouns she or her, didn't you? I was using the she and her pronouns in this case because my determination was, as I stated, that Ms. Hurd was the victim of intimate partner violence. That is why I was using the she, her pronoun. You, in fact, said women get into the relationship for all the right reasons. That's what you, you said. The woman gets into the relationship for all the right reasons. And then you say difficult for her, for victim to extric, extricate herself. You go on to say that she can and she should. Over and over, you use she, right? I believe in this case I did because I was referencing this case where I found Ms. Heard to be the victim of intimate partner violence. It doesn't mean that men don't get into the relationships for all the right reasons, too. I believe they do. Nearly every time you reference the perpetrator of IPV, you use he or him, didn't you? And it goes back to the same reasoning as I'm describing my understanding and my evaluation in this matter. Of course, men can be perpetrators and victims of intimate partner violence. That's well established in the research, and that's well established in my clinical practice as well. Isn't the reason that you use the pronouns that you did, that you almost always testify on behalf of a woman? That's not correct. You don't even remember the last time you testified on behalf of a man. Well, I don't testify on behalf of someone. I testify as to the results of my evaluation. I frequently treat and assess male victims of childhood sexual abuse who are coming into treatment for abuse by their Boy Scout leader, by their cat, by their coach, by their teacher, by a trusted adult. I see them in therapy. I see them in forensic matters, in criminal cases. So, so I, I treat and evaluate men I, all the time. I didn't ask you about treatment. I asked you about testimony. You, talk, you broke out your practice between treatment and testimony. I'm not asking about treatment. When's the last time you testified on behalf of a man? I testified recently in a deposition on behalf of a man who was traumatized because he was wrongly convicted. At the time of your deposition six weeks ago, you couldn't remember a single time you had testified on behalf of a man. I testified in my deposition that I testified in a case of a man who was wrongly convicted about 20 years and suffered physical and sexual violence in prison, and I detailed the traumatic effects of the, that that happened on that gentleman. All right. Why don't we take a look at your deposition? All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Transcript of the deposition that you gave March 28th, 2022, correct? Yes. All right. Let's go to page 77. Let's 
look at let's page 70 line 8 so you can't recall a single instance where you were hired by the attorney representing the male in an IPV matter correct in an IPV matter, not in a trauma matter or a child sexual abuse matter. Okay, so that's the distinction. You, you've never, you don't have any recollection of ever testifying on behalf of a male in an IPV matter. As I stated yesterday, the very first case that I testified in was in a same-sex intimate partner violence where the man was the victim of another man. I uh, okay. routinely treat and assess same-sex couples where the, then the female can be the perpetrator of another female and the male can be the perpetrator or a victim of, of his partner. So let me get this. You, you testified in a case where one male is alleged to have engaged in uh, IPV against another male. Correct. All right. Okay, but that's the only one you remember. That's the only one you remember. You remember? No, I've done this frequently, as you well know. Most cases don't go to trial. I've worked on hundreds and hundreds of cases. You've limited to testimony. Many cases don't come to trial, but I've issued reports and worked on many cases of same-sex intimate partner violence where men are the victims. But but I did ask you about testimony, and 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 I limited your the question to testimony. And the only testimony that you remember is the two is the same sex couple, right? There were multiple same sex couples, I believe, that I testified. That you in. testified in court at trial. I believe so, yes. All right, but you didn't remember that in in March. I did remember that in March. Okay. Uh, you're a professional witness, correct? That's not correct. No, you make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year testifying in court, correct? not testifying in court. I conduct thorough, comprehensive psychological evaluations of individuals who are involved in a court case. The majority of those cases never show up in a courtroom. And half of my practice and half of my income is about my clinical work with people who are coming to me for therapy. I, I didn't ask you about the other half of your income. I'm, I'm asking you whether you made a hundreds of thousands of dollars a year testifying as an expert witness in court. As you're phrasing that question, that's not correct. I, that would be the amount of income that I generate from my forensic practice. I testify perhaps maybe once or twice a year. The best, most of the work is done behind the scenes in evaluating individuals and issuing reports. But you'll agree with me that a big part of that practice is providing expert witness testimony. That's not correct. No? That's not a big part of your practice. If I testify twice a year, that's not a big part of my practice. All the other time is doing the work for the cases and evaluating the individuals and issuing reports. All right. What percentage of work do you devote to forensic psychology? As I stated yesterday, I, I say half and half clinical, half forensic, but I also have a substantial amount of time that I use in the professional activities and serving on a professional board. So what portion of your practice do you provide expert witness services? I think you're using the expert witness services synonymous with the forensic psychology part of the practice. So the forensic psychology practice what I do here today is one part of it, and it's a smaller part as opposed to all of the evaluations and individuals that I'm assessing. Your practice is successful enough that you maintain your offices on Madison Avenue in, in New York, correctly? Correct. I've had that office since 2005. Right. Um, and you're sufficiently successful at your uh, forensic work that you're able to perform unpaid work at a hospital, correct? Correct, and I also do pro bono work as well. There. Um, in fact, you actually instruct others on the use of expert testimony in court cases, correct? On the use and understanding trauma and violence abuse in the courtroom and how to, for advocates and people who could not have this level of training or experience, how to come into the courtroom and talk about very difficult issues of domestic violence, yes. All right. 
Can we pull up PX 1241? You recognize that document? Uh, yes, it looks like the front page of a PowerPoint presentation. And it's a PowerPoint presentation given by whom? By myself and Mary Ann Dutton, who is a uh, very well-known and respected researcher and clinician in the area of domestic violence. And what's the topic of the PowerPoint that you're giving? Expert witness testimony in cases involving domestic violence. And who did you give this uh, presentation to? That was to the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. Um, that is an organization that provides legal services to women who have assaulted or killed their partners in self-defense, and mostly people who these individuals, the, the women who they've seen in treatment are through shelter-based programs or through advocates, and those are individuals who don't really know how to come into the courtroom and talk, and that's what, what this um, presentation and training was for. I'm going to move uh, PX 1241 in evidence. Any objection? No. All right, 1241 in evidence. Do you want it published? Or? Yes, let's publish it to the jury. Thank you. Okay. All right. Why don't we pull up PX 1242? You recognize this document? Yes, this also looks like a PowerPoint presentation that I gave. All right. What is the name of this? PowerPoint presentation? This is called The Use of Psychological Experts in Cases of Domestic Violence. It was presented to the Kings County Bar Association, which is in Brooklyn. And what this presentation talked about was some of the things that I talked to you all about yesterday, the myths and misconceptions in intimate partner violence, when women use force, what happens if they drop protective orders, how they present in court. And that's what this presentation was to attorneys at the Bar Association. Okay. But this is another presentation that you gave uh, as to the use of psychological experts, and you gave it to a, to a bar association. Right. They were prosecutors and defense attorneys in attendance at that bar right. association. At your deposition, you testified that you were going to be paid $100 an hour for your time in this case. I did not testify to that. You did not? That's an error in the transcript. Oh, that's not, that's not right. That's correct. So, and you corrected the transcript? We did not do an errata in the transcript at uh, this point. So you knew there was an error in the transcript, but you didn't fix it? There were several errors in the transcript. But you didn't fix any of them? There was no time to fix them. That's correct. All right. So you're not being paid $100 an hour. How much are you getting? I'm being paid $500 an hour. $500 an hour. And that's what, um, and that's the bill you sent for your deposition, right? $500 an hour. Correct. Uh, you submitted a number of uh, disclosures in this case. Um, you have not formed an opinion as to whether Mr. Depp committed intimate, intimate partner violence against Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct. I formed the opinion that Ms. Hurd's report of the intimate partner violence is consistent with what we know in the literature about intimate partner violence. You have a limited role here comparing individual data to group data and then just determining whether it's consistent, right? I wouldn't say it's a limited role, but that's generally correct. Uh, you wouldn't use the word limited role? A limited role in terms of how we go about a, a forensic evaluation, not a limited you, role in this case. Do you remember whether you use limited role in your deposition? I don't. If you have it in front of me, you probably think I did, but yeah. sure. Uh, and you have no independent knowledge of the facts underlying the alleged abuse, correct? I have the knowledge of the plethora of documents that I've reviewed in this case. No, I'm asking you your independent first-hand knowledge. You have none of that, right? You mean whether I was there? Yeah, you of, weren't there. Of course not. Okay. Um, and you're not testifying to the veracity, the truthfulness 
of any of the allegations. Correct. I'm testifying to the consistency of the data points of all the different documents, including the psychological testing and the clinical evaluation that I conducted of Ms. Hurd and how that comports with the therapy records and all the other documents and the photos and texts that I reviewed. And you have no personal knowledge of any abuse? Correct, personally. Correct. Right. And all you know is what Ms. Hurd self-reported to you and others? That's not correct. Because you did collateral interviews? And I reviewed medical records, and I reviewed other witness statements of what they witnessed and what they saw. And all of those statements that you reviewed, those were statements that started with Ms. Hurd, correct? Not necessarily. Well, the medical records did, didn't they? Well, the medical records, if she's self-reporting what happened to her, sure. I mean, that's what we do when we go to a physician. We say, I have a headache. We're self-reporting our difficult. Yeah. Um, everything Ms. Hurd reported directly to you was after she was sued by Mr. Depp in this case, correct? Correct. And you didn't meet Ms. Hurd until, what, September 2019? That was the first evaluation appointment, correct. How'd you get engaged? Engaged? How'd you get hired to oh. do this work? Um, I was contacted by the legal team. Or were you interviewed by her legal team as to whether you were going to testify here? I was not. You were not interviewed? I was not. You were contacted? Correct. Had you worked with that legal team before? I had. Yeah. So they already knew who you were, right? Correct. Right. And at any time that you were working with Ms. Hurd or assessing Ms. Hurd, she could have chose to fire you, correct? I suppose her legal team could have chose to fire her. I was not her. She is not my client. The legal team is the one who hires me. I am responsible to the legal team, not Ms. Hurd. And this legal t and the legal team hired you already knew who you were because you worked together previously. And clearly they knew of my expertise in this area of intimacy partner violence and traumatic stress, which is why they contacted me to work on this matter. All right. Several times yesterday, you used language about assessing Ms. Hurd's relationship with Mr. Depp. You remember talking about that? Sure. You can't assess a relationship without talking to both parties, can you? You certainly can get a lot of information from one party, absolutely. But and especially gonna... when it's buttressed by other documents, including four years of therapy records and couples therapy records, you can get a lot of information based on those documents and that contemporaneous reports of the relationship. Respectfully, I didn't ask whether you get a lot of information. I asked whether you can assess a relationship without talking to both parties. I believe you can. There are certainly limitations inherent in that, but you certainly can. You talked to Ms. Hurd for, what, approximately 30 hours, right? Correct. How long have you spent with Mr. Depp? I did not spend any time with Mr. Depp. It was my understanding that he did not sit for a psychological evaluation. Right. In fact, you never met Mr. Depp, have you? I have not. But you purport to be able to assess the relationship between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? But I also read Mr. Depp's transcripts of his testimony. I watched his deposition testimony. I reviewed his medical records. I reviewed his text messages. So it's not necessarily totally blind. I did have information, although I'm not making a conclusion about Mr. Depp himself. Is the standard now not necessarily totally blind? I'm That's how sure. you assess the relationship? If it's not necessarily totally blind, I can assess it? No, we recess as clinical psychologists relationships all the time. That's what we're trained to do. It's certainly someone who's been trained in intimate partner violence to understand and look for the dynamics that happen in that relationship. And then when we have external data that supports what the individual is telling us, way before this legal case even came on the scene, that becomes very strong data to support that conclusion. Let's talk about some of that data. Sure. All right. Uh, you chose to conduct some collateral interviews. Correct. Right? Um, and you interviewed Dr. Bonnie Jacob. Correct. 
And you were, you looked at her notes. Correct. And, and you know that Miss Jacobs, Doctor Jacobs, uh, doesn't know anything about the version of what happened in Australia until Miss Heard had already been sued. Correct. I believe she was not in treatment with Dr. Jacobs at the time the Australia incident occurred, so that would be correct. She did reach out to Dr. Connell Cohen about Australia, who she was treating with at that time contemporaneously. I'll ask you about that. We'll okay. get there. So, uh, you know that Ms. Hurd stopped seeing Dr. Jacobs in August 2014. That's correct. And she didn't go back until after she got sued, right? I believe that's the date. I'd have to look for, to make sure, but I believe that you're correct. Yeah. And you said you reviewed Dr. Con you, you interviewed Dr. Connell. That's correct. And you also reviewed his deposition testimony. That's correct. And you know that when that he testified that when he was treating a patient, he assumes the patient is telling the truth. Correct. I believe he said something to that effect in his deposition. And if he, he has no reason to believe otherwise, if there's no other data to believe 